Good afternoon. Welcome to our second part to our series on uh, resilience, com resilient communities. Our first part uh, was, our first webinar was resilience in um, principles in resilience. Our second webinar, this webinar is titled resilience assessment. I will be joined by Dr. Jenny Hadbud and she'll do a presentation for you on um, her studies and work in resiliency um, and talk about the way to maybe assess it in your community or uh, with your region. And, but first I'd like to start by uh, talking about um, the program we have at the Center for Community and Economic Development. My name is Jennifer Bruin and I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for Community and Economic Development um, at MSU. And uh, the program that brought Dr. Hadbad to us, uh, we call the Comprehensive Economic Recovery Initiative. So I'm just gonna share my screen and a few slides with you just for a couple minutes. Comprehensive Economic Recovery Initiative is the title and it is funded by the US Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration. This came about through the CARES Act funding that we um, applied to receive. Uh, this was a non-compete application um, for university centers across the United States. And so with that, we were able to start in July of 2020, last summer, and we are using um, the, the support from EDA to offer technical assistance to regions in Michigan, uh, those that have been hit hard by this global pandemic. Um, we'll be able to offer this assistance through June 2022. Um, so if, if you're interested in learning more, um, it is on our website, uh, msu or ccd.edu. Um, but let me explain where this came from. We have a concept here that, that we put forward to EDA and it, it starts with the idea that the framework that we have been using in the 20th century for our economic development practices and tools has been um, built around a growth paradigm and looking at GDP rather than maybe wellness or well-being. Um, and with time, the assumption was is that we would become stronger and, and a more resilient um, state. But now that we've seen with the pandemic, that is not necessarily true. In fact, we've learned that it is actually um, shown a, a light onto the discrepancies and the disparities and the inequality that's going on in our state. Um, so we began to think about what types of um, areas that are, need attention. Um, and that brought us to looking at this concept of donut economics. Um, if you're familiar with it, it, it begins with a, looking at an ecological or a more um, social and ecological way of thinking. And so that we, we proposed that maybe we could begin to shift that way with using our Siri program um, and transition to a new model that may look very similar to donut economics. Um, donut economics came, to, came about several years ago um, out of Oxford University. Professor Kate Rayworth is um, the woman behind it. And it supports a more regenerative, regenerative and distributive system. Um, and that is a lot of what Dr. Hadbad will also be talking about. Um, so Siri is built around four pillars, and these are the four pillars that we identified as being the key areas that we really want to give attention and focus to in Michigan. Um, and those are resiliency planning, 21st century communications, um, and circular economies, and financial resiliency. So if you're interested in learning more, again, go to our website. Uh, if the University Center um, is reicenter.org, or you can go to CED. Um, I think it's CED instead of CCED uh, website, and, and we can um, also answer any of your questions. I'm going to end there. We don't need to go into detail on this. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Hadbad to you. Okay, so Dr. Jenny Hadbad is an assistant professor in the Department of community sustainability. She's an expert in resilient food systems, 
environmentally and economically sustainable food systems that can equitably feed a growing global population while adapting to security threats such as climate change, changing preference, and economic shocks. An environmental social scientist, she has over 10 years of experience in operationalizing social ecological resilience theory and has carried out resilience assessments on three continents across the spectrum of urban to rural food systems. Dr. Hadbad, are you there? Yep. All right, are you ready to present? I think so. Hey, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so hi again, everybody. Um, it's nice to be here for the, the second part of this series, which um, is building off the theory we presented last time to think about how to actually operationalize resilience and assess it in your particular um, system of interest, whether that be a city, the state, a farm, etc. cetera. Um, today is mostly going to be focused around kind of the the toolbox approach i use to assess resilience which splits into three different phases so i'm going to give some brief recap of just resilience in case you weren't here last time and then move into what is resilience assessment and then the three elements to it um conceptualizing the system how does the system respond to change and desirable futures within that there are six tools or techniques that i'm going to discuss um with the caveat that none of them will necessarily be um, enough detail to go off and do it yourself straight away, but hopefully it will give you the kind of um, the basics and then feel free to email me afterwards if you would like more help. Um, I've also put, I realized I didn't put any references at the end of the last one, which was bad practice. So this time I have included references and um, the links to them will be embedded in the slides as and when those are put on the website. So you'll be able to link through to certain applications of these methods as well. OK, with that, um, last time we phrased, uh, we talked about how I use social ecological resilience, um, which is a particular form of resilience. There are multiple different ways people use the word resilience. This has been taken um, coming from ecology, but then brought more into a coupled systems perspective to mean the capacity of a system to respond to change through adaptation or transformation while maintaining structure, function and identity to support positive and proactive development. And the idea here is that we're not thinking about resilience just as the idea of bouncing back, but that we um, because our systems are dynamic and constantly changing. As you're in the process of responding to something, you want to be able to build back better, right? And, and bounce forwards rather than just bounce back to where you were. We talked about how there are these seven principles of resilience um, that support those actions of adaptation and transformation. And I nested them into two broad categories. The first one being that diversity really is the bedrock of resilience. The, the, to a point, the more diversity you have in the system, the more backup plans you have. And, and diversity also influences the fact that you want some diversity within your networks and the connections that you have within your system. You want diverse um, forms of knowledge to be able to learn from. You want diverse voices in the room making decisions. And you want that to not just be in kind of um, one form of governance, but that there's diversity in, in the participation across how communities are represented as well as formal governance actors and business etc to promote polycentric governance generally we also want our systems to um, be looked at as systems and so not just also think about the one element we're really interested in but have a broader perspective to understand all the different things that could be changing simultaneously and often what we're most focused on is the things that are moving rapidly and that we have to respond to kind of quickly. We don't wanna forget that there are gonna be certain slow variables in the background as well that can also have a big impact when they reach a threshold. So for example, um, there's been you know things in the news this week given the Nobel conference about tipping points. We're seeing things to do with ice melt that once you get to a certain point, there's no return after that. Those are the types of slow variables that we need to keep an eye on. So we ended by saying, OK, well, that's all well and good, but what does resilience actually look like? And we outlined these different types of um, processes that demonstrate resilience from kind of short term, reactive um, coping based actions to more long term and proactive transformation. And the point here is that resilience is demonstrated if you can use coping or adaptation to maintain the current identity 
or if you can intentionally use transformation to change to a new identity. But that if you go through an unintentional change, either you cannot cope or adapt to maintain the current status quo, um, well, that, that you cannot maintain, uh, cope or adapt to maintain the current system, that then indicates a lack of resilience. And what I kind of ended on was this point that the principles can help us explain these different actions and they apply to all three forms of action. So really to frame us going forwards for this session, what I wanted to start with is the point that resilience assessment is really there to identify which actions this coping adaptation and transformation are happening and what principles are underpinning them or the lack of the actions basically. A really important guiding question that that I find really useful is to to start any resilience assessment is resilience of what to what and for whom and so I'm going to unpack that a little first resilience of what is really just being very clear about what social ecological system you are interested in and having to come up with some boundaries for that system. We talked about last time how systems are really complex and there's lots of different scales that will influence the thing you're interested in. But just for the practicality of assessing resilience, you really do need to draw some boundaries somewhere. So that might be, you know, if you're really interested in the impact of the pandemic, then you might say, OK, I'm interested in the pandemic on the city of East Lansing or the state of Michigan. That's you determining some kind of spatial and governance based boundary. You also need to say how long of a time period you're interested in looking at resilience of, because obviously um, that can get a lot more complicated with the longer your time period. Then we want to think about the resilience to what? So obviously, I've just given an example of that with the pandemic. But is there a specific shock that you're interested in? Or is it more that you're interested in how your system has responded to different types of shocks? That's a decision that you want to make pretty early on. And finally, resilience for whom? What we need to remember is that not everybody in our systems is going to experience resilience the same way. We already know that where the inequities are within our system, and we want to make sure we pay attention to those as we look at resilience assessment too. So we need an understanding of who is in the system and how their experiences are differentiated. I will say that um, I find this framing the of what to what for whom really helpful because it's quite simple. It has been made a lot more complicated, particularly in the field of urban resilience. So um, if you're interested, I've put a citation in here. It's a Sarah Mirau paper, and she's got up to five W's of urban resilience, adding in the kind of for when, for what, for where, etc. Um, I'm going to stick with the simple version today because I feel like that's complicated enough. But if you're interested in there is a whole uh, extra kind of lens on resilience in urban systems on that side. There's a couple of important notes I wanted to make about language just before we move into the how to do this. Um, because we've talked about social ecological resilience being a property of complex adaptive systems, it doesn't lend itself easily to measurement. And that's why I will always talk about resilience assessment, not measurement. Using kind of um, trying to boil this down to one indicator, for example, and measuring one thing in a quantitative way, often indicates that what you're studying is the kind of engineering resilience idea of, of a rate of change or a bounce back, which the point I wanted to make last week and I totally forgot was that that is where the language of resiliency with a Y comes from. And poor Kylie with my um, very pernickety language. Um, I don't study resiliency, I study resilience with an E. It might seem like a really minor difference, but it makes my life a lot more complicated. <laughs> so I like to just be clear about that. Uh, there's a really nice paper by Alison Quinlan et al that talks about how if you set out to monitor one or a very narrow set of indicators, you block this deeper understanding of the system dynamics that we think about within social ecological systems. And it becomes much riskier to base management actions on that because you don't have the full picture. So therefore, in my world, we assess resilience to understand system dynamics. We don't measure it. What that doesn't help is that it makes things a little bit tricky because we don't there ha therefore have an explicit methodology for a resilience assessment. It's going to be pretty context specific depending on what type of system you want to study. So usually you'll see that resilience assessments are case study based. They're adapted to that, that city, that state, that ecosystem, whatever it is you're interested in. Generally, they're interdisciplinary. You want 
to be able to understand the social, the ecological and the social ecological um, elements of the system. And finally, they're often participatory. So we want to include a range of perspectives within the assessment um, to make sure that you're not get, you're, that you are getting to that equity perspective and the resilience for whom. I use a particular um, kind of ge uh, generation of resilience thinking that comes from a group called the Resilience Alliance that I'm affiliated with. They intentionally set up resilience assessment tools to be used by managers, um, often of ecosystems, but it's become broader than that now. So river basins, etc. Um, with the idea that it gave a loose structure to kind of adapt with the group of stakeholders that were relevant to that system to create adaptive management plans. The idea being that this isn't a one and done process. It's something you do. You test something, you study how it worked and you re revise your plan, basically. And this process allows managers to assess relatively how resilient their system is to certain shocks and to identify the co components that either foster resilience or cause its um, erosion. So. The bad news is there's not just a set of tools I can give you for that are going to work specifically for your context. The good news is there are tools, right? And so what I'm going to present today is a toolbox approach, which has some um, methods that can be adapted to any context. And generally, the whole kind of tagline behind this is that we really want to try and understand the past to be able to think about the future. So we want to learn about how the system responded to shocks in, in recent history or not so recent history to understand how it's structured, what the identity is, how it was created, and then think about what we want the future to look like and how do we learn from what we know has worked in the past um, to build on that in the future. I tend to start with the resilience of what, and, I've, and within the framing I've offered here of these three main components, that's the conceptualizing of the system, the social ecological system. So whilst this sounds really complicated, it's, it's just like, what are you interested in right is it you know a particular city is it a particular you know is it a food system are you interested in a river in particular um whatever it is you just need to come up with a certain bounded system to start off with there was a comment in the questions last week about scales uh, multiple scales interacting and i will say that the um caveat here is that you then need to think about what is kind of affecting your system from both larger and smaller scales you know a, a city might be subject to national economies or federal rules or um, bottom-up change coming from individuals or neighborhoods or communities so you want to have an idea of those different interactions too but you just need to start somewhere so once you've picked your system what we're going to do is then use the same type of framing we looked at a couple of weeks ago to identify what the core components of it are and how they interact, because that's what helps you understand the structure and function and identity of the system. So I tend to go back to that same social ecological systems framing that, you know, we've, we want to work out the key ecosystem. We want to work out who is in it and who's using it in what way those are the actions and then what they get back from the system so that's the ecosystem services if you're in a really urban context it the focus on ecosystem services might be pretty limited right it might be i'm just interested in the supply of food energy water i say just those are all massive things but you know don't be too scared about the language of ecosystem services it's just what are you getting from your surroundings basically to start with, I'm just going to go through three of the tools that help us identify the kind of resilience of what or conceptualize the system. So the first one is really vague and it's just scoping. You've just got to become familiar with your system. The second one is actually doing a more intentional mapping of the resources that you're interested in. And the third one is that mapping of the stakeholders and the, the social kind of structure of your system. So most of the examples I'm going to use today are coming from Flint um, and the work that we've been doing there. But I also do a lot of work in rural systems and particularly food systems in East Africa. And so actually the scoping has proved to be much more important in East Africa because I don't get to go there very often and it takes me a while to learn the most up to date context. So this is pretty vague, but essentially it's just really important to get familiar with your system. And I phrase that as kind of scoping. So this might be sitting down and talking with key informants, be they key um, policymakers representatives of farmer groups, etc. 
There are some formal tools that I use to do that. For example, transect walks, where you go on a walk with an individual across kind of a line in the in the environment, and you just note what you see and you take notes. And our last time in Ethiopia, this proved really important because while we were there to uh, look at the impact of a dam that had been built, what we realized doing our transect walks was that there were other threats that the community were dealing with, namely locusts, which had come and eaten the crops and the fall armyworm, which um, was also eating the crops. So that gave us a few more different types of shocks that we had to build into our resilience assessment. Generally, this might not help the kind of um, the, the people within the system who already know these things very well, but it helps me and my framing for the complex adaptive systems thinking. And so in the right hand side, as these pop up, you're going to see the different principles that this tool helps you understand. And so this one is just really important to build your understanding of the complexity of the system. Digging in more specifically, um, you really want to focus in on the ecosystem components that you're interested in because you might not be interested in all of them. Um, again, we haven't really done this in our Flint work so much. So this is an example from the Ethiopia work. But what we were interested in is how people had changed their use of the landscape since the dam had been constructed. So um, what you can see on this photograph is a picture of the a satellite picture of the river and surrounding areas that we sat in in focus groups annotated or the community annotated to say, well, this is where we used to do agricultural kind of crop production. This area is dry now, so we grow here instead. This is where we graze our animals. This is where we get certain minerals, etc. And just annotating that process helps me understand what resources are in the landscape and the, and the kind of trajectory of their change. And the dots help um, with that because then we say, okay, has this increased or decreased? And that's where the red and the green dots come in. I'll just caveat, nothing I do is very complicated. So this GIS map makes it look really great. I didn't make that. That's when I pass my, my lovely annotated maps over to cleverer people than me. And then they integrate them into uh, GIS layers to build up um, a picture of that change over a much broader area. Um, this is a method that is written out in one of our papers that I'm happy to talk about afterwards. But for the minute, I'm going to move on to, to what I think is probably more relevant on the stakeholder side. So what this gives you is um, an idea of the diversity of resources in your system, as well as how they're changing, and particularly, are there any slow variables of interest? On the social side, what we've done a lot of in Flint is to try to build an idea of the social structure of the food system, which is what we're interested in in that context. So we've done a lot of um, stakeholder mapping with focus groups that represent different um, neighborhoods, different people involved as consumers or um, pr producers pr in urban ag, those involved in the emergency food system, those involved in retail, etc. The idea here is to kind of um, understand A, who's in the system and B, how are they connected? And obviously at the scale of a city, you're going to have to put people into bigger groups. You're not talking about individuals. But there's a couple of different reasons why we do this. The first is really just to check from a perspective of our research that we're talking to the right people. So is what being is what is being drawn on the map actually who we have coming to our groups? The second piece is that this informs the resilience for whom and lets you know who's, whose perspective you should be seeking as you go through the resilience assessment. So what you can see in this picture is, um, and I'll, just in case you can't see because it's small, is two different colors of post-it notes connected by arrows. And the idea is that a post-it note lists a group, um, a store, a church, etc. that's a, a, an important organization within the food system in Flint. Yellow ones represent that they're actually within Flint. Blue are important groups or organizations that are actually outside of Flint. So maybe some of the state-based um, actors. Then what we do is think about how these different groups are connected. So in this example, a blue line shows that they're connected through the transfer of food. A green line shows that they're connected through the transfer of financial flows and a red line is more about information. The map that you can see here came from um, a group that was more to do with the governance of the food system. So you can see that there's actually lots of red lines. And what was interesting is, when, not surprising, when we did this with the community, what you would see is a, you know, residents at the center and then lot, kind of a star shape. So you've got lots of arrows going out 
and there's different stores being listed where they you know buy food basically so you've got a two-way exchange of food and um, finances what this helps us to do is um, we then digitize it and we can look at the combination of multiple different activities to see who gets mentioned a lot and that's what this graph on the left is showing you um, so when our focus groups, it became obviously residents are really important. There's a, there was a lot of people that mentioned residents and put them right at the center as they should. Churches were really important, as was the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan. And you can sort of begin to see the structure of the system. And this helps you understand um, A, the complexity. So different types of um, sub networks that might exist which might demonstrate that information, for example, is, is being transferred between groups or isn't. Um, things like central organizations who are important to be able to share things quickly, or groups that are actually quite isolated and, and don't seem to have good connections within the city. There's also really rich qualitative data that comes from this type of activity. Okay, and so the combination of this um, is important for multiple different principles. It helps us understand the diversity of actors in the system and how they're connected, who's participating in what types of exchanges, and therefore who maybe can learn from who through the um, exchange of information. If we summarize all of that for Flint, um, which is what we've been doing in the Leverage Points project in Flint, although this is three years of work in one slide, so, so happy to answer more questions on this afterwards. When we came to answer that first question, we knew that we were really interested in the combined system of Flint, Beecher and Burton, and particularly the food system within them, within them and over a pretty long time period from kind of when Flint was thriving to now, to look at different types of responses to different types of shocks. The ecosystem is a pretty urban landscape with some urban agriculture, so the main ecosystem services are the provision of food and water, but that often doesn't come from within Flint. Um, there is a sense of place that is really important that people get from uh, being Flint residents. And obviously water regulation is important given the water crisis. Our stakeholder mapping helped us outline who the different key kind of groups are within communities, within the retail sector, within the nonprofit sector like NGOs and churches and within the governance system. And the main actions that the, these processes outlined were things to do with the retail and distribution of food, its consumption, and then a bit of urban agriculture. And so from that, we were able to kind of come up with the structure and function of the system and this identity as a kind of post-industrial city characterized by low food, low food security. So knowing that, that helps us come up with some indicators that we can use to um, from these four categories to look at how the system responds to change in the next phase. So for example, we looked at um, urban agriculture footprints. We've looked at food security dynamics, which you can see in this top right, that the food security rate is a little higher in the Genesee County than it is in Michigan as a whole. We've looked at numbers of pantries and we've looked at food distributed through the food bank to those pantries, which as you can see, post water crisis rapidly increased. And those, tr so going through the conceptualizing the system phase helps us in create indicators that we can then create quantitative data sets of and looking at if there's any changes in those over time helps us kind of look at specific points that we might want to study to see well is this a lack of resilience or a demonstration of resilience the significant change in them so that leads us into the second phase which is combined resilience to what for whom and really this is um i'm going to start with this piece on the right which is thinking about how does the system respond to change so here we're going to go back to that question of are you interested in a specific shock or a pattern of shocks and we can use timelining to help identify those shocks then i'm afraid it comes to just boring social science so then we use surveys and interviews to think about who has been affected how by those shocks and what types of um, resilience actions they've used to cope with them or to adapt or transform and then um, we end up in this phase of desirable futures so if you know what the system, how the system has previously responded to change, what would you want to change? What kind of future do you want to create? And we present a, a visioning tool to help you do that. So the timelining, again, I'm a big fan of post-it notes. It usually is lots of post-it notes on a long line with one post-it note per year, yellow post-it notes again to demonstrate things within the focal system, blue outside of, 
and then a conversation around it to come to consensus about a the actual timing of those events and b which were most impactful and how did they affect the identity of your system or not and who was most affected or not um what you can see on this bottom picture is that we've actually used our timeline as an object at community events to get more input from different community members in flint so it's become a, an, an additional boundary object actually for dissemination and the idea here is that it really helps you with that second half of the principles further unpacking the kind of slow variables in your system because you can start to see patterns over a longer time period when it comes to thinking about how and who actually responded to those shocks um, we tend to then look at this kind of the indicators we've previously analyzed and think about um, if there's specific periods in time we need to ask about and then use a stakeholder map to understand who do we need to ask about those indicators and how they changed and how did people respond and so this is the long list of, of topics that i have asked about in surveys i've never asked about all of these in one survey because we've never needed to you, you use the prior stages to hone in basically so um for example in flint what we've been looking at is really the kind of um we have we've done mostly qualitative work actually on this so it's kind of thinking about well what what were the coping strategies in, in place to allow people to respond to the water crisis? And it turned out to be, you know, access to pantries and the emergency food system. So we then go and gather statistics about the use of that over the last kind of five to 10 years. Um, in Ethiopia, for example, we've been looking more at a system that's trying to create transformation. So what type of um, attachment to place and occupation do people have and how is that limiting or supporting them changing their um, livelihoods entirely. To try and make this a bit more concrete, um, I thought this diagram might help. This kind of outlines the types of things we would learn from those types of interviews or surveys. So in an urban context, what you might find is that people are really relying on their social networks to, a, to cope with some kind of shock. So um, I got sick for a week, I couldn't work, I missed a pay packet, but my mum or my friends or my neighbours are going to help, you know, feed me for the week, something like that. That's kind of relying on your social networks. The next step is to try and maintain the life you have at the minute, but you have, might have to do something a bit more significant, like sell certain assets. Or you might just be able to access kind of public safety nets like the emergency food system. Adaptation we talked about as being a more significant change. So this might be actually changing your job. It might be you know, joining or creating new groups and changing the social networks that you're involved in. From a governance perspective, it might be you know, implementing a new rule or policy. And then transformation up at the top end of this is actually you know, totally leaving the region, for example, to go and work in the same job somewhere else or changing um, the types of livelihood opportunities that are around in your system. So what we see in Flint is that shift from kind of industrial to post-industrial creates this very significantly different structure and function of the system. Um, and on that note, so here what we see from the from the how did the system respond to change phase in our Flint analysis, you've got multiple top down shocks that are being um, implemented by people outside of the community often, but the community have to respond to. So GM leaving created this whole shift in kind of employment within the city. Supermarkets leaving changed the distribution of food within neighborhoods. The water crisis just affected people's trust and um, autonomy kind of within the governance system, as well as having impacts on health and well-being. So all of these shocks have led to significant kind of change, particularly in the food system, in the retail and distribution of it, and in the consumption of food. And often what our analysis shows is that costs are borne by the communities with benefits accruing to external actors but that the community isn't one um, homogenous group, that there are different elements within the community who've had to bear costs in different ways. What the, the kind of these types of exercises can show you is obviously how communities cope and adapt to these types of shocks. And so what we see in Flint is that there's a real utilization of diversity within the system, within the food system, for example, in the emergency and the supplemental and the retail sector. There's really strong kind of connectivity and participation with community groups. 
but there are limits to what those um, principles can provide from a resilience perspective, which is indicated by the still kind of low levels of food security and dependence on pantries and the fact that good ideas keep coming, but they don't necessarily scale up to the city level. So these types of analyses, if you remember from last time we talked about regimes, like and I showed a picture of kind of the, you know, the, the industrial to the post-industrial regime, for example. Being able to identify those regimes comes from this collection of, of tools and the understanding it creates about what shocks might have created that regime shift, how different groups responded, and which principles supported their response. Often, why we're interested in resilience is because we know we're not actually super resilient to something or that the resilience is not the form we want and we want to create a desirable and resilient future. So this kind of desirable futures piece is really um, has in mind acknowledging there will be shocks in the future, but thinking about what shocks and how you want your system to be resilient to it in the future. So in our Flint case study, um, we use the stakeholder map to inform um, a, a who we should go talk to about visions for the future. And we held focus groups to um, co-develop kind of values as priorities for a future food system in the medium term, kind of 2030, I think. Um, that was a pretty traditional qualitative discussion. And so what we did was code those, the qualitative data that emerged from it for values. And then we used a ranking tool called QSort to help extend that to a much broader group and understand whose priorities are different. Because not everybody's going to have the same set of values for the future within a system as big as the Flint food system. So this can help us understand who has values in common, who has diverging values and start to come up with scenarios for how to achieve some of those values. You might not achieve all of them. Um, and that's where the Flint project is actually going to go one step further than that and embed that within participatory modeling to to identify scenarios to achieve those futures. So the questions that we asked are pretty generic and then we had a lot more specific questions about for different people with different roles in the food system. But it was things like what do you appreciate about the food system and why? What worked well in the past? What didn't work well in the past and what would you like to see in the future? And this protocol is actually written up and available on the MSU um, Flint Leverage Points project website, which I can share the link to afterwards. It helps with all the principles, I'll be honest. It just is more information, but kind of within a future sense rather than looking backwards. Um, and what it did for us was allow us to identify 17 values that were, were across all of the focus groups. And it showed that actually most people's values within food are actually really embedded within social welfare. And so what we could do was kind of think about then how to build this into our participatory modeling. And the idea is that the visioning helps us create scenarios, which are kind of pathways to these futures and to a future that achieves these values. So then we can integrate the stakeholder mapping to say, okay, well, who can, who can do what within those pathways? Who has the tools or the knowledge or the connections to start implementing steps within that pathway to get to this future? And that's where everything kind of comes back together. So that was a lot of things in not a lot of detail very quickly, but for some reflections, um, again, this is supposed to be a, a kind of adaptive process that you can use the bits that are useful to you and that helps you come up with an overall um, approach to managing the system. Because they're not a fixed process, you might need to build teams to do this, and that might require people with different forms of knowledge or an interdisciplinary approach. Where you start in the process um, is up to you, really. In, in some projects, if you know you want to create a certain type of future, you might want to start by planning out that future. If you don't know a lot about the system, you might want to start with conceptualizing the system. But the whole point here is that it's iterative and this should be sort of creating a way of uh, a different way of thinking about our systems that is one where we continually integrate monitoring and evaluation. And that's why there is an arrow from the desirable futures back to the conceptualizer system. Because once you start on a pathway towards the future, you need to check into how it's actually changing your system and how it might or might not be changing how the system responds to shocks. Um, 
And then finally, just because we're not quantifying something or measuring it doesn't mean this isn't useful, right? It's giving, this process gives you a ton of different types of information, which is really useful, including things you can measure like those key indicators. So um, the point here is to build up a kind of diverse knowledge base, which allows you to understand why some things create change and why, other, and why others don't. And that in itself builds up an idea about the resilience of your system. So other people have thought about this in a much more um, easily <laughs> digestible way than me, possibly. One of the tools I would recommend is this Wayfinder website, which has been built with colleagues in Stockholm and at the Resilience Alliance in Australia. Um, and it really is intended for um, non-academics, let's put it that way, managers, planners, community groups to be able to navigate towards a particular type of sustainable and resilient future. It follows a similar series of steps, you know, building a group to create a certain type of change, creating a shared understanding of the system and of the future you want to create, um, understanding the system's dynamics, etc. Highly recommend having a look at that. If you, you know, obviously these are the citations that are more kind of academic, but I'm happy to share other ones um, if there's specific things you're interested in. And hopefully this gives us 20 minutes for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Jen, any comments just while I scan the Q&A or? Um... Sure, go ahead. Let's check the Q&A. There's a couple of questions in the chat as well. Okay, all right. I have, I have, I have both up here. Um, I'm going to do the ones in the chat first so da, 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 da. yes nested systems we like those a lot um how is the pandemic and oh and what a that's what an excellent question obviously the pandemic has really impacted engagement work um we were in the middle of those q sort interviews so asking people to rank the values that we'd elicited in group work and that had to stop basically because it wasn't we, we were particularly focused on doing that with food insecure populations and we it wasn't obviously um, at that point appropriate to go and do face to face things at pantries, etc, as they were changing their model of food distribution as well, so a lot of our work sort of paused for a few months while we regrouped certain elements have been done remotely, so I think Chelsea's on the line she's one of our. Um, colleagues on the Flint project who's been doing a photo elicitation project to understand how people's interactions with food changed through the pandemic. So they take pictures on their phone and they text them to us and then there's a kind of interview over the phone or zoom at the end to kind of unpack some of the meaning of those photos. Um, I would say generally our engagement has become more individualized rather than group based just because it's it's hard to get a lot of people in a zoom call from certain communities and that's totally understandable. And it sort of slowed down a little, but we learned and, and we adapted over that process. And so there's some really cool stuff happening um, at the minute for multiple different groups across campus and, and broadly. Environmental justice. Um, so my interpretation of environmental justice is to embed it in the resilience for whom element. Really what I'm trying to get at with that is that there are going to be that we know there are already inequities within our systems and we often need to really work hard to make sure that we're giving voice to the people who are most marginalized who might not usually be the loudest voices in the room and so doing the stakeholder mapping plan at least helps us check our assumptions about who is in kind of what type of power dynamic basically to give us a, a focus on on who we might need to make a specific effort to go work with or get the opinions of. Um, generally, this, this piece about resilience for whom is reacting to a critique of resilience theory coming from ecology, where often what you would have is, sorry to anyone that works on lakes, but a lake that people were like, okay, we have a, an ecological resource we need to manage. And there's you know one manager that we need to work with to make sure we understand this system. But in reality, that lake might have been used by a multitude of people for different reasons. So a lot of the early resilience assessment work was we should work with this one manager and find out their impact on the lake and, and assess the resilience of the lake. 
the last 10, 15 years of work has said, actually, that's not the most important. I mean, it's important, but it's not the end of the story, right? What you need to do is say, okay, well, here's a person or a group or an organization or a policy. Yes, they had an impact on an ecosystem or a social ecological system, but how did that impact then affect all the other groups who use it and try and, and it makes the resilience assessment a lot more complicated, but by really being intentional about unpacking that resilience for whom, we have a much better idea about all the different ways that that change affects different groups and and loops back around to change the ecosystem again. Um, there's a question about the scope for doing a resilience assessment and yes, too big gets really difficult just because um, of that point about for whom it can be very difficult to include all of the diverse voices It doesn't mean it shouldn't be tried, I think it's just having to be comfortable with certain levels of of grouping because you're going to have to right you can't talk to every individual in a city so um for example in australia every river basin has to have a resilience assessment now kind of on deck um and and update them every four or five years i believe that's a really big scale for me for, for a resilience assessment but it's obviously working i would say the the level I've probably been most successful at is um, community level, where you then can start to break down your community into certain subgroups, but you're pretty confident you're going to get to talk to all of them at some point through the process. Um, still, my, the, and your final question about resilience of pandemics, my God, there is going to be a lot of resilience studies of pandemics there's already been a huge number of publications which i find really i'll be honest a little frustrating because we're in it it hasn't finished yet and so the one thing i would caveat is that resilience assessments take a lot of time and they benefit from a backward looking perspective where you can see the the kind of dynamics play out and these dynamics haven't stopped playing out yet we're still in a, in a pandemic so for example, the, the types of pandemic studies that I think are more appropriate are things to do with, um, there was some to do with the resilience of the meat value chain to do with the impact of certain closures of processing packs, packaging or processing and packaging sites. That made sense to me because they've reopened since. So what you can do is look at the resilience of the sector to the shock of certain things closing and see how if you take like meat being produced as one of the key indicators, you can see how that changed over time and potentially how it recovered to something that was pretty similar to what it was before. Those types of smaller scales are easier to look at because the time scales are smaller. The, the bigger your spatial or governance scale that you're trying to look at, like the resilience of Michigan to the pandemic, I would say it's too early yet to really understand that. But one of the things that this should have been teaching is that we should be taking keeping track of all the data we can now so that when we do look back on this in a year two to five years time we have all the information we could okay um evan yes kumu is my favorite website it is um kumu is a um a networking kind of website so it's if i had showed you the picture it, it's kind of cool because the balls bounce and those things are exciting to me so yes we and um, what we can do is make a spreadsheet basically with the post it notes on and then you upload or you can do it directly into Kumu and just create a new blob for every post it note. But what it gives you actually is that spreadsheet feasibility at the end that then you can download and it gives you certain network characteristics within already. Um, so you can identify the most central nodes between the scores, etc. It also just looks fun. And so when you're using it as a kind of communication tool, it's neat because it gives you things you can embed in websites, etc. Okay, what is the relationship or difference between resilience and regenerative development? Um, that's a great question. They're just different in my mind. So resilience is a systems property, whether or not the system is regenerating or eroding or such, it will have it will have some form of resilience, kind of high or low. And so regenerative development, one hopes, is going to build the resilience of your system in a desirable way. 
but the resilience will be there what like it, it it's a systems property so good or bad there will be some form of resilience or a lack of it that they're, they're just kind of slightly different the resilience is something where you think about the system as a whole the regenerative development is you being very intentional about what you're trying to build within your system i think um that's not the best answer to that question i'm going to try and rephrase that in a different way Last time we talked about how resilience is not necessarily always desirable. You can get stuck in kind of systems that don't support well-being, for example. To me, regenerative development is one that should always be increasing well-being, right? It should be increasing the resources we have in our system rather than eroding them. The likelihood is if you can do that, if you can replenish the things that you're using or or even you know increase them as you use them, which is what regenerative de development is all about, you should be providing beneficial resilience through that because you're most likely increasing the diversity within your systems and you're increasing the connectivity within your systems and the chance to participate and learn. So I think it's that like regenerative development can support positive resilience. The caveat being that, you know, undesirable forms of, of uh, or resilience of undesirable systems might make it pretty hard to establish regenerative systems because there's going to be certain things that kept are kept locked in place by the existing resilience. So, you know, we're, we are locked into certain types of economic systems at the minute. It's great thinking about rewriting them entirely to embed Kate Raworth's um, donut at economics ideas. There are some really powerful people who do would not benefit from that transition, right? Or organizations. And so they create a certain amount of resilience in the system, which means it doesn't change. So it's really just kind of talking about two things side by side and hoping that you can co co-develop both in a beneficial way. But resilience is just a systems property. So we just need to be aware of it um, in whatever form of system we have basically at the minute. Okay, Alfonso has asked in the context of the pandemic, what do you suggest a resilience assessment or an adaptive capacity assessment? That is a great question. So um, adaptive capacity is just one piece of resilience, right? A lot of people, when they say that they are measuring resilience, often what they're measuring is the adaptive capacity of the system, because those are elements that we can quantify and create measures of and indices of. So that long list of things I had in the table for in the survey, a lot of those are me measures of adaptive capacity. What type of education do you have? What assets do you have? What are your networks like? Um, it's not easy actually to kind of quantify adaptive capacity. There is no one thing it is, but you can, you can understand lots of different things that influence adaptive capacity positively and the good news is is that if you're studying adaptive capacity you're halfway to studying resilience because it's a really important part of resilience right it helps you explain how the system has coped or adapted um, to things in the past what you're often missing if you don't broaden it into a into a resilience assessment is that piece about well what is the system responding to so the resilience kind of of what to what and for whom if you just focus on adaptive capacity, often what you're looking at is um, just the resilient, it's kind of part of the resilience to what, and you might get to the for whom if you do adaptive capacity assessments with different groups, but you don't have that broader system history, you don't have the, the, the knowledge of which shock people are responding to in what way, and you don't have the piece about intentional change through transformation. So I think in the pandemic context, what we're seeing right now is actually a window of opportunity for certain types of transformation that actually what this has shown us is how our systems might not be working for us from a well-being perspective or from an ecological sustainability perspective. Um, and so what this offers is a chance to actually think about transformation and transformative capacity in more depth and add on to the adaptive capacity understanding to try and think about how to move us kind of bounce forwards rather than just return to where we were before. Great question though. Is there an intersection, Evan asks, is there an intersection between foresight and resilience practitioners? I'm going 
to admit a little bit of ignorance here in that my futurism and futurists and scenario planning literature is kind of limited to the visioning and scenario planning literature. So I'm I'm imagining what foresight means, but if I get it really wrong, send me a comment like, nope, try, try that again. I would say the intersection really is in that desirable futures piece that, um, yes, there's a lot of overlap there between what people are trying to do to look forwards and create kind of ideas of sustainable futures we can work towards. And a lot of those folks have a background in resilience, actually. Um, there's a really great program called the Good Seeds of the Anthropocene, which acknowledges that we've moved into this totally different kind of global regime where humans are the, the um, main force on our planet and that not that a lot of people already suffer because of that and that we might create a lot more suffering because of it but the anthropocene is a like i said last week the good news about all this complexity in our systems is that there's really infinite ways we can design them right we can interact with we can restructure our systems we just have to want to restructure them so that piece about scenario development and kind of future thinking and desirable futures in particular is really trying to build on that and, and embed this idea that that resilience thinking offers an opportunity to reimagine our futures and, and say, yeah, we might be locked in, but at least we know how we're locked in now. And here's how we unlock that and create kind of a reorganization in our systems. So I think, yes, there is a lot of overlap specifics. I don't know happy to be told more about it um, and learn more about it and this last question is just excellent um i feel like i should say the economic one but let's face it it's a, it's any form of strange matter donut because i'm in england at the minute and it's been five months since i've had one and england does not do donuts well don't tell them but um yeah any kind of donut from strange matter would be fine right now in my life Oh dear. Those are some great questions though. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I, I actually I have something that I wanted to yeah, yeah ask you is that this this idea of um how do we learn from the past? Mm -hmm. I mean that almost seemed like that was a problem right from the beginning of this pandemic. So how do we learn better? I mean oh gosh, the million dollar question. Um Billion, trillion, we've been through that. I think I I think one thing is just kind of availability of information. I think what the pandemic highlighted really well is that our systems have become so complex that we often don't know how they work. Like the average consumer in the grocery store has no idea. Like you might have labeling of like where the food is from, right? But there's no real, there's no other labeling about, well, where else it traveled to, to be processed, to be packaged, to then come back to like where it was sold, for example. Um, the complexity of how our food and energy systems are interlinked is something that only really became uh, common knowledge to a lot of us in kind of 2008, when you started seeing biofuels policies pop up and suddenly oil prices were changing and grain prices were changing. And so, I think if we had better kind of clarity in in and data availability about how different elements of our system are connected, that would be a really good start because it would be much easier to see the kind of cause and effect of certain types of shocks. Um, none of them seem surprising once we see them, right? Like you think about the impact of the pandemic on women, for example, right? There's this just horrific statistics about job losses mostly being kind of for female workers and then the implications of what that means for kind of families and food security and children's health and such and so none of that actually is that surprising once you think about it but it wasn't necessarily something that we had thought about enough to set up safety nets in advance right to say well then then these are the things that we need to make sure we can cope with or adapt to the different types of shocks and one of the things I suppose is that we're really good at making our systems efficient as you know let's minimize costs maximize outputs but that inevitably decreases resilience because then what you're doing is getting rid of the backup plans and often we design our systems to be efficient 
um, to cope with kind of little and semi-regular shocks that we know we can anticipate. We weren't prepared for a one in a hundred year pandemic, right? We weren't often what you'll see in kind of, um, you know, with a dam break in Michigan last year is, eh, we probably didn't anticipate that one happening so soon. So we weren't really prepared for that one either. And yet those things are only going to become more common as climate change kicks in, as, you know, our systems are just more and more integrated and concatenated and there's just more and more shocks coming from totally different places that we would never have had shocks from before. So that was a long answer, but like, I think generally it's transparency of information and, and learning from the past and actually accepting we're going to have to be a little less efficient and possibly pay a little more for things to be able to cope with them in the future. Yeah, I think maybe there was a little bit of um, naive thinking yeah. And it's not our first pandemic. I mean, right. right. And I think that some countries maybe were a little more prepared. That's yeah. The truth now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Another great presentation. Really, really good information. I see all these glowing comments in oh. here. Have you noticed, Dr. Hadbai? Yeah, a lot of really appreciative. Um, Great information, great talk. Um, geez, we might have to do a part three. <laughs> I don't well, know, if anyone has any, maybe a panel or something. Yeah, I was gonna say, if there's any specifics, like feel free to email that for something, like if there's a tool you wanna go through in more detail. Um, we are actually preparing, so at least for kind of the stakeholder mapping and the timelining and the um, visioning, there'll be tools coming out, like tool two pages coming out of the Flint project as to like how to do those things that will be available on our website within the next couple of months. Um, but yeah, anything else, happy, happy to talk through. We can um, grab those links from you probably once they're on your website and, and share them and Yep. send out maybe a follow-up email and we'll also add them to the Siri website and, and get that information out because that's the, really the, the nuts and bolts, right? The tools to do these things. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I don't think there are any more questions. There was one just about the slides and the recording and I guess that's gonna be on your website, right? Yes, the first session is already on our website. Um, okay. It's under the media tab and I think Emma might have thrown in the link to Siri. And I think, you know what, I'll throw in another, well, we're about to end. So it is on our website under the media tab in webinars um, and Dr. Hodbod's right at the top. So you won't have to scroll. Um, and we'll add this second webinar to that page once it's transcribed and, and ready to go. Um, we'll have both of them up there and we'll be sharing them through social media if you forget to check back to the website. Great. Yeah, very good. Thank you right. so much. Yeah, thanks Let's everybody. Think about here. Yes, indeed.